Om Shri Sai Ram. I offer my most loving pranams at Bhagwan's lotus feet. I pray to Swami that He gives all of us the understanding that it is Swami who speaks and it is Swami who listens through each one of us. Elders, sisters and brothers, Sai Ram to all of you. We welcome you to another episode of our series of satsangs from Prashanti Nilayam. And as always, it is great pleasure for us to join you all from our studios here at the Shri Satisai Media Center. I would like to begin with an episode that I've heard from some of my teachers. And this happened at Thrai Brindavan. For those of you listeners who are not very familiar with what is Thrai Brindavan, it is Swami's residence in the ashram at Brindavan, Bangalore. And the beautiful thing about the Thrai Brindavan Mandir is, whenever Swami is at Brindavan, after the evening Aarti, Swami would give the opportunity to the students there to gather around Him in what we call a Thrai session. A very beautiful opportunity where Swami would sometimes speak to the students, Swami would have some elders speak to the students. On one such occasion, when Swami had gathered with some of the students, there was also an elderly lady devotee who was in Swami's presence. So this lady was telling Swami about the progress that her son had made and she said, Swami, by your grace, my son has completed his education and now he is going abroad for higher education. Swami didn't say anything to it. So this lady perhaps wanted to coax Swami a little further and she said, Swami, in fact, he is Swami's student. The moment she said that, Swami looked at her and Swami said, No, he is not my student. The lady was surprised because not very long ago, the boy had just graduated from the very campus, the Brindavan campus. She said, No, Swami, he studied here. Swami said, He is not my student. The students and teachers around also were surprised because they all knew who this boy was. In fact, one of the elders seated there also tried to they remind Swami, quote unquote, that Swami, that boy indeed studied here. Then Swami said something which was very important for all of us who have been given this opportunity to be Swami's students. And that is why this teacher was narrating this episode to us. Swami said, he may be a student of the university, but he is not Swami's student. And then Swami went on to give a beautiful and very deep and profound explanation for that. Swami said, when you join a college or a university, the university has its own curriculum, it has its syllabus, it has an attendance that you will have to fulfill. And when you fulfill all of these criteria that the university puts forth before you, and then you write your exam and you clear it and your practicals and theory and all of that, and at the end of it, the university will give you a certificate saying that yes, indeed, this person was a student of this university. Swami said, in the same manner, even I have certain prerequisites before which I will not certify you to be my student. And Swami said, you could be a student of this campus, of this college, of this university, but to be Swami's student, you have to fulfill my criteria. As I said, a very profound interaction, something that we all have to think about, but not merely Swami students, even those of us who claim to be Swami's devotees. Swami would often say, and I think he writes even in the Gita Vahini, we proclaim our love for Swami, but shouldn't it be He who says that this is my devotee? On one occasion when we had a youth conference or a workshop for youth at Prashanti Nilayam, which I also had the opportunity, opportunity to be a part of as one of the speakers and panelists. We had mentioned this episode and we were telling the youth that this is what we all must strive for, to get that approbation from Swami himself. The point was made and the point was well received. But the subsequent day when we were having a panel discussion, and uh, as I said, I was also one of the members in that panel, when we opened up for questions, one student got up and said, you know, I, I was truly moved by uh, that narration of Swami 
saying that you should do certain things before I can call you my student. So the boy said, what should I do? What should I do to get that approbation from Swami? One of the co-panelists then made, made a statement which was very, very true, but absolutely contrary to the point that we were making. This panelist said, why do you have to think like that? Swami's love is your birthright. You can demand Swami's love from Him. Swami loves everyone and you don't have to be or become anything to be an object of Swami's unconditional love. It's an absolute truth, isn't it? Well then, how can two things that are contrary be true? This is true and what we said was not wrong either. When I was a student once, Swami had taken our class for a, a small session at a devotee's house. It was a very beautiful and warm setting. Swami was seated in the living room of this devotee and we all had gathered around Swami. So were the family members of that devotee. And Swami was sort of introducing some of the students to the devotees and the devotee to the students who were there. So Swami was speaking to an elderly gentleman and Swami asked him, how old are you? And this devotee said, Swami, I'm, well, I don't remember the exact date, uh, year that he said, but somewhere in the mid 50s or late 50s. And immediately Swami said, oh, you're going to turn 60 soon. Swami said, I will do your Shashti Abda Purti. Right? It is the ceremony that is done when the husband of a couple turns 60. It is something like a spiritual marriage that is performed. And we know that Swami has done this or given this blessing to many devotees of he himself performing the Shashti Abda Purti. So when Swami said this to the devotee, understandably the devotee was extremely delighted. There was a, a smile on his face. And then Swami turned to us who were there and Swami said, see this person, I performed his wedding. Now I'm going to perform even his 60th uh, wedding, the Shashti Abda Purti. And when Swami said this and reminded him of what a blessing that Swami had showered on him and his wife, this devotee was moved to tears. Choking up, he looked at Swami and he said, Swami, thank you so much, Swami, thank you so much. When he said this, Swami had a playful frown on his face and Swami looked at him and said, Thank you, Induku. Why do you say thank you? And then Swami said something which was so very sweet to hear from Swami. Swami looked at him and said, This is your right and my responsibility. Swami said, This is your right to receive this grace and love from Swami. And it is my responsibility to do this for you. His love is our right. So says Swami. During the discourse that Swami delivered in 1984 during Guru Purnima, Swami was making a very beautiful and very interesting point. He was talking about the various avatars and Swami said, every avatar that comes down comes with a vow or uh, an assurance that this is how I will lead this avataric life. And Swami was giving various examples. We know about the vow that Rama has taken, that one arrow, one word and one wife. Swami was making a reference to all of these different declarations by various avatars or the various declarations that he himself took upon himself when he came in these various forms. And then Swami said, this avatar too has certain vows such as that. And then Swami spoke about the three vows that define the Sai avatar. And I'm not saying it in the order exactly the way Swami said it, but these were the three points that Swami made. Swami said, when this avatar takes up any task for Loka Kalyanam, for the benefit or welfare of the entire world, how many ever obstacles come on the way? the step taken forward will not be retraced. Swami said, this is the first assurance. The second assurance that Swami gave is, Swami said, this avatar will stretch his hand only to give and never to receive. This is how this entire avatar is going to be led. 
And the final assurance that Swami gave is, once when I say that this devotee belongs to me, that devotee may fall into wrong ways, may not obey Swami, may do wrong things, but I will never give up that devotee. Once I've taken someone into my fold, I will never ever forsake them. So here is Swami categorically saying, these are Swami's words, that I will never give you up. So why then should we think that Swami's love is not granted and we should find ways to strive for it? When he says that my love and grace is your right, do we really need to look at ways to earn it? What happens when we take Swami's love for granted? One of the things that you observe, that you can observe in your own life, like I've observed in my life and every devotee can, that when certain hardships come our way, when something happens and we want to call out to Swami and we want we want that it should be sorted out. I think when we take Swami's love and grace for granted, we will get quite upset with Swami, isn't it? Why should I suffer like this when I have you, Swami? When you have cured that person, why should I suffer the disease? When you removed the problem for that person, why should I be enduring this problem? We tend to get a bit upset with Swami when we are going through the ups and downs of life, which is quite natural, isn't it? I recall one of the uh, students narrating this episode to me. This was when he was still part of a youth group. And uh, whenever they would come for Swami's darshan, Swami would come and call them for an interview. And we all know how beautifully that entire sequence would pan out. Swami would come and ask, where are you from? How many of you are there in the group? And then Swami would call them inside in for an interview. That's pretty much how most interviews would uh, be granted, isn't it? So Swami comes up to this group of youngsters and uh, Swami tells them, how many of you are there? I think something like that must have happened. And Swami tells them, I will speak to you tomorrow morning. Meaning I will call you for an interview tomorrow morning. So you could imagine they were all really excited. The next morning came and it appeared that Swami had completely forgotten about it because Swami didn't call them, Swami didn't come anywhere close to where they were seated and the students, I mean the youth, were disappointed. So they all went back to their dorms where they were staying in the ashram and they must have vented out that disappointment that had built up, right? I mean, quite understandably and they said, oh, Swami gave us a word and he didn't keep up the word and why does Swami have to do like this? Why should Swami tell that he's going to call when he has no intention of calling? And we all let our minds run away with it, isn't it? Oh, Swami is interested only in the rich people. Oh, Swami wants only, Swami will talk only to his students. All these sort of preconceived notions start pouring out in the form of that frustration. That afternoon, Swami comes and promptly calls the group for an interview. And when inside the interview room, Swami spoke to them, whatever he was speaking uh, generally to the group. And then Swami said, I know you were all very disappointed this morning. And I know what you all spoke in the dorm when you went back. And understandably, the youth were a bit embarrassed and apologetic about how they had spoken. But what Swami said after that was very, very profound and I think something that we all have to keep in mind. Swami said, see, I, I do not have any problem with anyone criticizing me. But I want, to have a, I want to make a request to all of you, Swami said. Try as much as possible not to speak ill of Swami. Swami said, as much as possible, try not to get angry with Swami and speak wrong things about Swami. Swami said, because it's not that I will get upset and I'm going to do something to you or something bad is going to happen to you. Swami said, see, there is absolutely nothing but pure intentions in my mind. Nothing that I do is ever selfish. And it is not good for you if you revile such purity. And Swami said, I don't want you to suffer the consequences of that. 
So I'm requesting you, even if you find yourself going through the toughest of times, try as much as possible not to be upset with Swami. And I think even as I say this, I can think of so many times when I must have been upset with Swami. And I'm sure each one of you listeners also are remembering episodes such as that from your own lives. But I think what is more important is to remember that this is the Swami who will do nothing which is not best for me. Will do nothing which in any way will harm me. Will do nothing that is serving his own selfish interest, then why should I be upset with him? It's not easy, but perhaps that's something that we all have to try. The other problem with uh, taking Swami's love for granted or believing that I deserve Swami's love at all times, uh, we might think that Swami is not compassionate enough, perhaps. Right? is not kind enough or caring enough to come and address the problems I'm going through. We all know that quite often it would happen that Swami would not speak to a student or Swami would show that he is upset with a certain student. So there was a student who was going through that phase. One day, one of the teachers were moving towards Swami's mandir in Vrindavan. This was the time when... Uh, there was the old bungalow, that is before Thrai Vrindavan was built and offered to Swami. So this lecturer was proceeding towards Swami's mandir when his paths crossed the student, who was understandably downtrodden and I mean, downcast. He was sad about Swami not talking to him. So the teacher accosted him and asked him, so boy, how are you doing? And this boy said, sir, what do I say? Our life is Swami. Everything is for Swami. Even if you're thrown in the, the hottest of deserts, we're going to call out to Swami's name. But here we are at his feet and Swami is not talking to us. It really pains our heart and there is no will to live, right? That's how he had put it. This teacher was so moved by the devotion that this student had for Swami. He gave him a few consolatory words and then he moved on to Swami's mandir. And as soon as he entered Swami's presence, Swami asked him, Whom did you meet on the way? The lecturer might not have brought it up on his own, perhaps, but Swami said, Whom did you meet now when you were coming towards the mandir? And then the teacher said, Swami, I met so and so. He was uh, very, very sad. This is what he said that life is nothing without Swami. And in a typical way in which we all speak, he said, Chala Papam Swami. He is in a very piteous state, right? That's what it really means. And then Swami said, you should remember one thing. Swami is like butter. And I reside in their hearts. And when Swami said, I am like butter, it means I melt so easily. And Swami said, I am like butter and I am in their hearts. If I have not melted, it only means there is not enough heat. And then Swami said, the surprising thing is, it seems to have melted your heart. <laughs> Almost suggesting, are you more compassionate than me? And then this teacher realized the mistake that he was doing and he said, Swami, I am really sorry. If you are putting someone through something, you know, you know what is right. The most important thing in this journey of uh, we trying to, as I said, we know that his love is granted, we know that he loves all of us, but still striving for that love, what is the whole idea about that? In the same discourse that I quoted some time back, 1984 Guru Purnima discourse, Swami says, some of you might ask that when I tell I've taken someone into my fold and I will never let go of them, why do people who come to Swami still suffer? Right? Swami was himself addressing this question that is there in most of our minds, I guess. Swami said, people wonder, why should people who come to Swami continue to suffer? Swami gave a very beautiful and graphic example. Swami said, let us say, 
a man extracts a boon from God saying that you will live for a hundred years. Right? God has given him the blessing, you're going to live for a hundred years. Being elated with this blessing and feeling that the whole world cannot defeat him, if this man climbs the top of a tree and jumps from there, yes, he will live for a hundred years, but maybe with a broken leg. Swami said, when I give you the assurance that I am never going to forsake you, yes, that is true. But you also must do what is necessary to lead a good life. You must look at what you are doing, whether you are doing the right things, you are making the right choices. So the point is, yes, we have Swami always with us, no matter what. Because we are given to doing all kinds of stupid things, but Swami is never going to leave us. But the, the whole point is, we have to keep looking at the actions that we perform, the choices that we make, the kind of lifestyle that we are leading and ask ourselves, are we aligning it to Swami's likes and dislikes? There is another reason, the probably the primary reason why we should not take God's love and God's grace for granted. The purpose of this path of bhakti, right? we, are, we are essentially talking about this journey of a devotee loving the Lord. This path of bhakti is, is not for me to remain me and he to remain Swami. Right? That's not the idea of bhakti, that I remain this individual and the Lord remains himself. The whole idea is to bring about that oneness through this process of one loving the other, isn't it? The word bhakti itself is a very interesting word if you look at the meaning of it in Sanskrit. The, we use another word in the language called vibhakti. Right? Vibhakti means to make portions or to separate. So the word bhakti comes from that, to create separation where there is actually oneness. That is what is the role of bhakti. There is a very interesting concept that Swami speaks about and I just thought I'll uh, bring that to the table of discussion today. Swami speaks about this in some of his vahinis, I think even in the first vahini that Swami has written. Swami talks about two kinds of maya, vidya maya and avidya maya. Some of you must have heard the satsang that we had last week where Brother Sai Prakash spoke about the aspects of maya, especially how the Lord himself uses maya as a tool when he's performing his leelas. The Lord also uses the maya for this very essential journey that we all are going through. What is this Vidya Maya and Avidya Maya? To simply put it, Avidya Maya is that delusion which when you indulge in, it takes you further and further into Maya or delusion. Some would often say that this feeling that I need to earn a lot of money, only when I have comforts in life I can be happy. The various kinds of uh, attachments and things and possessions that we fill our lives with, they're all avidya maya. The more you indulge in them, the more further away from the truth you will be taken. But there is also another which is called vidya maya. Indulging in it will actually take you towards freedom from maya. And that is the maya that Swami employs. Because when you say, Bhakti is to bring about separation where there is oneness. It is this very maya that he is using and Swami in Prema Vahini makes a very beautiful point. He says, when you look at a worldly person and a spiritual aspirant, they both are humans, they both are made of the same stuff to, to put it that way. Swami says it's like uh, raw rice and boiled rice. They both are rice at the end of the day. But one of the primary differences between a worldly person and a spiritual person is a worldly person is lost in avidya maya, whereas a spiritual aspirant 
is engaged in Vidya Maya. There was a time, I mean, I'm quoting a lot of episodes where Swami was upset with students, but I think some of the most profound lessons were given by Swami at such occasions, I suppose. There was a time when Swami was again uh, not talking to the students for a while. He was avoiding them completely. <clears throat> he would not come and uh, interact with them like he would do every day in the mandir. It went on for a few days, maybe a few weeks. The students were a little upset with uh, how things were going on and they thought to themselves that they cannot allow things to be like this. They will have to go and ask Swami to forgive them. So they decided that that evening when Swami comes for darshan, they will encircle him and they will plead with Swami to forgive them and start speaking with them like he would do before. That evening Swami came, the students were all very emotional, they surrounded Swami and Swami looked at them and Swami said, what? And the students by then were all choked by emotion and they could say nothing more than Please, Swami, please, Swami, please, Swami, please, Swami. Swami looked at them and Swami said, Please, what? What are you asking for? When you say please, it means you're asking for something. But the students were not saying what they were asking for. They just kept saying, Please, please, please. And Swami said, Please, what? What are you saying? So one of the students said, Swami, please talk to us. And Swami looked at that student and said, What am I doing now? I'm talking to you. So the students didn't know what to say. They said, no, Swami, not like this. You, you're not walking uh, amongst us. You're not coming to where we are seated, like how you used to do before. Swami said, is that so? Okay, make a path. And Swami put his head down and walked through that block up and down, swiftly, as quickly as he could. Swami said, done, what else now? Swami was talking, Swami was moving amongst them, but things were not the same. And the students didn't know how to convey this to Swami. Swami, you know what we are trying to say. You're not, you're not normal with us. You're not speaking with us as usual. Then Swami said, boys, understand one thing. I have not brought you to me. I have not brought you around me. I have not come into your lives to be liked by you. And to make it, make the point even more firm, Swami said, a dog likes its owner. I don't want to be liked by you. Swami said, I want to be loved by my students and devotees. And if you really want to show love, the only way you can do that is by paying attention to my words. This whole journey of we trying to love Swami, we trying to earn Swami's love, which is an illusion, because as we started off with, his love is granted. It is in the world that we need to become something or be somebody to be loved by others. We need to achieve something so that people will look at you and say, oh, you know, once you start achieving things, people will start claiming you. Oh, I know this person, he's a good friend of mine. Oh, so and so is a relative of mine. But Swami's love is unconditional. He does not want you to be anything or become anything or achieve anything for him to love you. But that being granted, this illusion that sometimes Swami is unhappy with me or sometimes I have to do something to please Swami, it is this illusion that enables us to purify ourselves because that is the whole process. We are not here to remain ourselves and He remain Himself. He comes down in a human form so that He can lead us towards, towards that oneness, isn't it? So the truth is this, Swami's love is indeed unconditional and we should never ever forget that. The confidence that we draw from life, the confidence that we draw from this statement of Swami is indeed very, very worthwhile for our life and we should never give that up. But at the same time, to strive to achieve Swami's love, as I said in the beginning, to strive to receive that certificate from Swami's love, from Swami, where he says that he is mine or she is mine. That should be the one goal worth striving for in our life, isn't it? We have been 
gifted the greatest blessing that we could ever ask for. The day we came into Swami's fold, as Swami said, once I've taken you into my fold, I'm never going to forsake you. So the day each one of us, in our own understanding, we have come into Swami's fold. We don't know when it, ha it has happened, but in this lifetime, we probably will know that, okay, from this time, I became a devotee of Swami, or I had Swami's darshan for the first time. So imagine when Swami says, I'm never ever going to forsake you, the moment we have come into Swami's fold, the greatest gift has already been given to us. We have found the very goal of this lifetime's long journey. How are we going to respond to that? When we read the Ramkatha Rasvaini, Swami writes about a few of the characters in the Ramayana. It's very interesting, each character, how they responded to this very blessing that I'm talking about. When Rama is going towards Panchavati, Swami says that he stops for one night at the ashram of Sage Bharadvaja. Sage Bharadvaja, one of the great sages of ancient India, is has set up his ashram there. He has a lot of disciples there. So Rama stays for one night at Sage Bharadvaja's ashram. The next morning, Rama and Lakshmana very reverentially go to the sage and tell him, would you be kind enough to accompany us to the confluence at Prayag so that we can offer our morning prayers there? Sage Bharadvaja says that, oh, Rama, you can proceed if you want to but I am not coming for any morning prayers. And Rama is surprised. He says, don't you do prayers in the morning? You, you are the guru here. You must be doing all of these prayers. And then Bharadvaja says, I've done enormous tapas. I've done a lot of sadhana in my life. I've done a, I've set up my ashram here. I've guided so many people. Bharadvaja said, all of that culminated yesterday when I met you. The greatest blessing for all the sadhana that I performed was when I met you, Rama. Now to do anything for me is meaningless. And he tells Rama that you may proceed because you have come to act out a drama. But I know what you are. I know who you really are. I will not be pulled into this illusion. If you look at Mother Shabri, Mother Shabri meets Rama and she feels that her life's fulfillment has been achieved. So she decides not to live any further after that. Exact contrast, you have Hanuman who meets Rama and he says, now I will live, not just this lifetime, I will live forever for you. I think each one of us will respond differently when we look at this blessing that Swami has given us. Maybe we should ask ourselves, pause, what is my reaction or response going to be for this fact that I have been given the greatest blessing in my life? I'm not going to tell you how exactly we should think about it or how exactly we should respond. That is for each one of us to contemplate on. But these sessions that we have here, as satsangs is not merely to convey something to you all listeners. It is also an opportunity for self-reflection for some of us like me. So I'm going to take the liberty to reflect a little on this for the next two minutes before I conclude this satsang. Yes, I started off by saying or my entire talk was on how we should not take Swami's love for granted. But if we were to take Swami's love for granted, how should it reflect in our lives? There is a beautiful poem in Telugu, which was, I think, composed by one of Swami's devotees. It is not Swami's own composition, but Swami would quote this poem in the letters that Swami would write to his devotees. And Swami would say, make this your prayer. And I feel this should be how we respond to this blessing that has come our way. 
in the poem goes sirulakemi prasanna chittunda vainacho chalu nakade padivelu tanri sirulakemi prasanna chittunda vainacho what do i have to do with all the wealth in the world as long as you are pleased with me swami that is enough for me sukha sampadala kemi sumukunda vainacho chalu nakade padivelu tanri what do i have to do with conveniences and comforts and luxuries in life i have found you the one with the most beauteous face and that is enough for me swami korkala kemi ni kataksha munnacho chalu nakade padivelu tanri wishes may get fulfilled wishes may not get fulfilled desires might come desires might go i am not interested in all of that swami i have received your grace i have received that word from you that i am never going to forsake you isn't that enough for me is there anything more that i have to ask because i can talk for myself we we ask for all kinds of silly things of swami isn't it we don't even know what to ask swami so when he chooses not to fulfill a desire i think he is doing it in the best of our interest isn't it so kor kal ke me swami i might have wishes today i might wake up tomorrow and that might no more be a desire for me they will come and go i have won your grace that is more than enough for me vibhavani ke me ni abhimanam unnacho chalu nakade padivelu tanri vibhavani ke me what do i have to do with all the praise and position and name and fame that this world gives me today they celebrate us tomorrow they might not today they honor us tomorrow they might dishonor us today we have praise the same mouths might speak foul words about us the next day are we going to attach ourselves to the importance that all of this brings in our life vibhavani kemi what is there in all this name and form swami ni abhiman munnacho i have become a recipient of your love that should be more than enough for this life ichinavi evo unnavi inte chalu adikamula kemi avi eppudaina kalugu swami whatever you have given for me in this life i might be poor i might be rich whatever you have chosen and given me that is sufficient for me if i need more i can get it any time because i have you if at any time i need more than what i have you are here to give it to me and the final line of that beautiful poem goes veedu na bhaktudani ella velala neeku okka reeti anugraham unna chalu for me to receive that blessing from you that veedu na bhaktudani he belongs to me she belongs to me this is my devotee this is my property that one approbation from you that one declaration from you is all that i strive for swami to have that one blessing from you is more than enough if we really have to take swami's love for granted the best reflection of that in our life is constant undisturbed happiness isn't it because now we have placed all our happiness on something that is never going to change something that is never going to be lost won't our happiness also become eternal and unchanging i said that when we take swami for granted when ups and downs come our way we might get disappointed we might get upset with swami but when we really place all our happiness on swami nothing can take that away from us isn't it because now our happiness is not 
based on whether something gets fulfilled or something is received or something is achieved. Whatever problems may be there, may not be there, get solved, doesn't get solved. I'm poor, I'm rich. But the greatest blessing has already been given to me and nobody is going to take that away from me because my Swami has given me the word, once I've taken you into my fold, I am not letting go of you. These were the few thoughts I wanted to share with all of you as part of this week's satsang. As I said, this is not merely an opportunity for us to convey things to you. It is also an opportunity for inner reflection and contemplation for all of us. So I thank all of you for giving me the opportunity to share something with you, which I believe I need to hear more often. And I most humbly offer this at Bhagwan's lotus feet. And I thank each one of you for your lovely company and patient listening. Jai Sairam.